So, <clears throat> uh, first of all, it never occurred to me to ban phones. Um, you know, as, as an American, I'm, we have a more libertarian sentiment. I'm hopeful that we'll have norms, that we don't give our kids phones before 14. But as soon as I come to, over to this country, everyone wants to talk about banning things. It's just a British thing I did. They like to ban things. Um, uh, I'm not saying ban the sale, or, but I am saying let's have a norm. That we just don't, you send your kid out by the, by the time they're nine or ten, they should be sent out to play and have experiences that are unsupervised. And you give them a flip phone, a brick phone, a phone watch, so you can be in touch with them, you can track them. But you don't want to give a child the internet in their pocket. Because a phone in their pocket means that companies all over the world are fighting for their attention and taking it, they're winning. And men from all over the world are trying to get to young people for sex or, or photos or for flirt or contact. So it's just insane to put this supercomputer that connects them to everything in the world in their pocket, available all the time. Um, the first three norms were all about reducing the phone use, the screen time. The fourth one is the hardest one because that's the one where we have to give up something. The first three are about us taking something away from the kids so that they can, so that they can what? So that they can actually talk with and laugh with each other. But if we won't trust them enough to let them out, you have to say, you can have a friend over, but you know, I'm going to always be here. Or you have to always be supervised by an adult. Then they have no, chi they have no child. So the fourth norm is the most important, I'd say, and it's the hardest. And it is far more independence, free play, and responsibility in the real world. Because all of us, we were all let out, but the older people, we were all let out. I just did this, in the pre I've done this in a bunch of talks here in the U.S. Um, I can guarantee you. Um, actually, how much time do we have? Do we, uh, what, uh, uh, or let me just, uh, no, no. I think the thumbs up meant you're fine, no? Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's do this here. You might have seen, if you've seen my talks, have seen me do this before. Um, everybody who was born uh, before 1981, raise your hand high. Okay, so just you, okay, so put your hand down. So actually, what I want you to do is, the first thing is, everybody think about the age that you were let at. What was the age at which you could leave, you know, go outside, shut the door, bye mom, I'm going over to Billy's house, or you get on your bicycle, but you're totally unsupervised, you're out playing, no adults. At what age was that? Was that at age 6, 8, 10, 12, 14? Think, don't, don't say anything. Nobody's saying anything. Okay. okay, now, so everyone, everyone here, everyone have your age? Okay, so let's start with the older people. So those who, those who were born uh, before 1981, again, raise your hand again. Okay, you're Gen X and baby boomers. Put your hand down. When I point my finger into your part of the room, yell out your age. Just yell it out loud, okay? Yell it out. What was your age? Four. Eight. 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 Five. Six. Seven. Seven. Okay. Five. So you see, so six to eight is the norm. There's a few fours and fives. There's a few nines. But this was the universal norm, certainly in America and Canada and Britain. Um, six to eight is when you're let out. Okay, now... Let's do just the, just the Gen Z. So if you're born, again, we'll go to 1993, even though this millennium. 1993 and later, raise your hand high. Okay, now just you, when I point to you, you yell out your number, yell it real loud. 12, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, so you see how things have changed. Crime is down in general from the 70s, which was an insane decade. A lot of people were lead poisoned. There was a lot of violence. Um, drunk driving was very common. The world is much safer for young people now. We don't let them out because we're afraid they'll get kidnapped. We think they'll get by a car. We don't trust them. So, um, so it's we can't just take away the phones and keep them locked up. We have to we have to give kids back a real human childhood, which has some risk, and parents have to accept that. The kids are risk seekers and they need to be. I have watched a talk where you do that before and you've had a similar... Uh, yeah, it's always the same. Yeah, yeah. You know, the double digits when they get older. Um, the book has its critics, which I know is no surprise to you. Uh, I had a meeting yesterday with um, the academic psychologist, Dr. Lucy Folks, Dr. Ola Demkovich and Dr. Margarita Paniortu. And their biggest concern is that a smartphone ban won't solve or they say it's a very complicated, multifactorial issue of adolescent and anxiety. They don't deny that they don't deny that teens are reporting more anxiety, but where they think it would be more helpful helpful is to work on academic pressures in schools, which in many surveys came above smartphones as the major cause of adolescent anxiety. 
and which in the very results-based Britain has got a lot worse over the last 20 years. Um, and the other thing they thought would make a bigger change for anxiety was to teach children social media safety from the age of 11 so they understand the strengths and weaknesses of these platforms and learn to self-regulate rather than delaying immersion until they're 16 so that they then get this huge thing that could throw them off course right before they're doing their A-levels. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm sorry, the first thing they recommended was... Wait, what was the first thing was that they recommended? They think that academic pressure oh, in the UK is the bigger cause of yeah. our no, So, so Gene, Gene 20 has looked into this hypothesis, and we have posts on this at my Substack after battle. Um, if that was the case, you'd think that the kids who were college-bound, who were under a lot of pressure, you'd think that their mental health would get worse, uh, more than the kids who aren't, who were lower down, who were not focused on university. But there's no difference. Um, the amount of homework in the U.S. has actually gone down because our kids are so anxious and, and um, uh, fragile. Uh, we're asking less and less of them. But yet, academic strengths might be up because if you're spending five hours a day on social media, is what they are in the United States, five hours a day, TikTok calls to them. They have no time to do homework. So yeah, they're stressed about it. Um, so I see no sign that this was caused by a sudden Massive increase, or any kind of increase. There is no sign of an increase in academic pressure in 2012. So I see no evidence that this is related to academic pressure. The fact that it happened in New Zealand and Iceland at the same time, do you think that they also, suddenly, at the same time as everybody else, everybody decided let's put more pressure on our kids? It just doesn't, the timing doesn't work, the international emphasis doesn't work, I just don't see it as, as a major issue. Um, and secondly, they say it's a complex problem, absolutely. They say a smartphone ban wouldn't solve it. Absolutely. My book is not, let's ban smartphones and fix the problem. Simple. That's not my book. My book is, kids used to have a play-based childhood, which is a human childhood. We lost that, and now they have a phone-based childhood. And that's really bad. And so I'd like to ask any critics, say whatever you want about each piece of this. Do you really think that swapping out the play-based childhood for the phone-based childhood isn't going to have a huge negative effect? And I hope they wouldn't disagree with that. To clarify, when they were talking about the academic pressure, it was in one of the major surveys that I think you had used, and academic pressure came above social media as cause for anxiety. Well, we're never well done. When you say it came above, do you mean the students said that it was a cause of anxiety? Is yes. That oh, yeah, fine, sure. Yeah, so they will say it. Why do we have so much academic pressure? Because they have no time to do their homework. They're stressing out about it. Okay. And the social comparison. I mean, everybody's posting their scores. Everybody knows every the, the social yeah. comparison is constant and crushing. It's not because we suddenly put more on, it's because they got super connected and now everything is about everybody. Okay. All the time. They also feel strongly that banning something that teenagers have already had a taste of legitimately and in abundance will simply drive usage underground. And what we what you will get then is a two-tier adolescence where you have the haves and the have nots. The former will have smartphones because their parents don't care or they don't know or they get the allowances so they can buy them on the black market. And the latter will be treated as sort of second-class citizens. So you'll be left with this enormous cleavage between these two social groups. What do you think about that? Well, so first, as to the question of forbidden fruit, yeah, that's a real effect. If you make something forbidden, that will increase the attractiveness to some kids, not to all, not maybe to most, but to some definitely will increase the attractiveness. Fine, let's put that on the table as one possible backfire effect. Then let's put on the table direct neurochemical addiction, dopamine dependence on frequent, uh, uh, direct addiction is so much more powerful than any little forbidden fruit effect. Talk to, look at boys who are on video games for five hours a day, take them off as parents try to do, take them off and for the first few days they are miserable, they are upset, they can get violent because they need that level of stimulation. That effect is so big that it swamps, sure, there's a forbidden fruit effect, but I think it's tiny compared to these things. And then, even leaving aside biological addiction, social media is socially addictive. The reason everyone's on it is because everyone else is on it. With my students, they're 19 years old, students at New York University, and you know, we, we go through the problems, and I say, well, why don't you just click TikTok? Well, I can't because everyone else is on it. I have to know what's, what are the videos people are talking about. I have to keep up. So it's a trap, and I think that, again, swamps so I'm willing to risk the forbidden fruit effect. And again, I don't use the word ban. I'm saying let's have a norm that you give kids phones to communicate, but you don't give them a smartphone until they're 14. You can call that a ban if you want, but I call it, let's try to give them a, a, a play-based human childhood. 
Well, we've obviously focused a lot on bad things about social media, but there are lots of really positive things. Um, but, <laughs> let's, let's, do, let's do 12 year olds. Let's Hold go through for 12 year olds. What are the positive things for 12 year olds? Okay, Maybe. so for disabled and immunocompromised teenagers who can't leave their home, they have community through social media. It's also the way a lot of teenagers learn about grassroots organisations, momentums. It's a huge source of education for a lot of teenagers. And LGBTQ plus community, um, if they live in rural areas, conservative areas, you know, they know no one else in which they can gather with, then it can offer a huge amount of solace and resources. Um, doesn't it feel like a bit of a dangerous backslide to take away the community that it offers so many people? No, Rob, well, because you know what else does there? The internet. The internet started doing that in the 90s. It was a boon to all those communities you talked about. Suddenly, everybody could get all the information in the world, even if you live in a small, isolated town in northwest of Nebraska. There were all kinds of ways to find communities, to find people. You know what they didn't need in the 90s? A flood of stuff sent by an algorithm customized to keep them on by a company that doesn't give a damn about their welfare, that is, has, has employed many psychologists to keep them hooked, that feeds them stuff that is really, really bad for them. And you know who says, who is most likely to say that social media is harmful to them? LGBTQ kids. The 2010s was the greatest decade ever for LGBTQ rights and acceptance. If you are LGBTQ in the United States in 2019, before COVID, let's say, you should be the happiest generation of LGBTQ that has ever existed. But you're not. You're the least happy. And you're less happy than everyone else. That's not because we got so prejudiced, it's because we got, or because we got so unprejudiced. It's not for either reason. It's because LGBTQ kids spend more time on social media and they're more subject to bullying and harassment on social media. So how about if we leave them the internet, but we say these algorithm-driven platforms by giant, powerful companies that are exploiting us all, that we let adults make their choices for, how about we don't let them do it to 12-year-olds? Again, I see no benefits for 10, 11, 12-year-olds to being on social media when they have the rest of the internet. Now, seriously, do you? I was more thinking 13 to 16. Okay, you know, let's go there. Tell me a benefit to 13 to 16 year olds. I'm very conscious of time because I've been giving a sign. <laughs> and I will ask you one more question before we go to questions. Oh, that's right, read the interview, Rashid. <laughs> um, it's a really fair point. I hadn't considered the chat rooms could sort of um, fill that gap. I still say chat rooms quite addictive, but anyway, I've got more time to go into that. Um, do you not think it makes more sense? I'm pretty sure you'll say, yeah, but that's not going to work. But I'm going to ask you anyway. Does it not make more sense to lobby big tech to get them to make sense of features of social media apps, the addictive scrolling, for example, less addictive? Um, they've been very open about the fact that social media is designed to hook people and it's designed to hook people at a very young age. Are we letting them off the hook by, I won't use the word ban, delaying immersions? Well, no, because. You know, what do you mean lobby them? Like, 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 say, three keys with sugar on top? Like, what is it? What do you imagine happening? Um, instead of looking to pass various, I mean, you're suggesting to pass laws, right? Um, I'm suggesting to change norms and have, give me one law, which is the uh, minimum age of 16 that's, that's verified. Give me that. So why, why would it not be better to use our one law to get them to, I don't know, stop? the amount of bulletins they can send in an hour, the amount of notifications you're allowed, or that you're not allowed uh, yeah, to, to limit that always on them. Yeah. So once you get into the game, once you give your kid a smartphone and let them get social media accounts, and you get into the game of software to monitor their web use, and which doesn't work when they're on social media, none of those programs can reduce what they see on Instagram or TikTok, and you start getting into the game of parental controls, this is what has happened to family life. And hardly anyone is able to do that. Um, even in Silicon Valley, so really key here is that the people who made this technology, they don't do all these controls. They just say, no, you can't have it. Uh, they don't send their kids to schools full of educational technology. They know how bad this stuff is. They send their kids, a lot of them send their kids to schools that use no technology, such as the Waldorf School of the Peninsula. Zero. There's a computer room. Of course, they need to learn to use the internet so they can go and take computer classes. And they're on computers at home, so it's fine. They don't know. 
But the people who made this technology know that it's really bad for kids. They don't want their kids exposed to it. Um, and um, um, wait, what was your original question? I go off on rants sometimes. Would it not be more salient to use our one law oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. on them? That's right. Yeah. So once you get into questions of content moderation, all these things, you're just into an infinite morass in which the kids are going to outplay you. The only way to avoid this is just don't let it start. Once it starts, you're going to lose control. No one's yet questions anymore. It's very hard for you to get the results you want. Um, so uh, just delay. And it's hard if you're the only one, but if we act together, if you act with the parents of a few of your kids' friends, you already know who they are, you're already communicating by text to arrange pickups and things. So, um, so if you coordinate with small groups or with schools, then it becomes much easier. And delay, delay is the way. There's really no, you know, again, once they get on, once you give them a smartphone, it is going to move to the center of their life for the rest of their life until it gets implanted directly into the brain. But until then, it's going to be right in front of their face for the rest of their life. And I'm saying, how about we don't do that at 10? In the UK, shocking statistic, Ofcom reported that of your five to seven year olds, guess what percentage of them have their own smartphone? Smartphone, 24% of your five to seven year olds. Because everyone has discovered it's an amazing babysitter. We're all busy because we have hours a day ourselves of social media to do or to consume. So we're all really busy. You know, and you know, we're all paying continuous partial attention to our kids because that way we can keep sort of doing email while sort of interacting with our kid. And it's terrible for everyone. And if you just give the kid what she wants, he or she, they want the phone or the iPad. That's what they want. And if you give it to them, you get to do your email or your texting, whatever it is they want to do. Are you giving me a look which is like, I can't tell this look. Is this the look of like, yes, I do this and I'm guilty? Or is this the look oh, of, oh, 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 good, 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 okay. 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 What was that like you just like, what were you, what was I was thinking, have you ever thought about making a baseball cap that says, today is the way? Today is the way? I don't think I made that up. I think someone else said that. But oh, okay. I just, that it's right issue. Um, let's go into questions because I'm sure there are some good ones. Um, apparently, you have to speak really closely to the microphone. Okay. And I especially okay. encourage members of Gen Z, if you can add to this conversation, especially if you can tell me what have I missed. I, I can only get better if I hear from you about what I've gone wrong. So please do raise your hand with objections or suggestions. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Um, I actually have two questions which we can ask both. One is it seems to me that the elephant in the room is the advertising industry, which you know, all the all the apps, all the tech companies are fighting for that ad space. That's where they need the data. And so the there's a misalignment of interest. They the, the, they need our attention to sell the data to sell to sell to ad companies. Can we, I think all these things that you're mentioning are great, but they're just drops in the ocean uh, for the whole problem. Um, can we um, employ some kind of a strategy like we did in the 80s with the uh, cigarette industry to actually um, curtail the advertising uh, space uh, to not allow, um, you know, the whole news feeds and scroll, scrolling on that. So that's the first part of my question. And actually, it's attack it from that angle instead of trying to kind of, okay, well, let's get the schools to, I mean, yeah, great, but I just think it's just, there's just too much around and you won't be able to really have a big effect. Uh, and, and then the second part is uh, the adults. Like, is there, are there any studies from age 30 to 60? I think that, that's a huge problem as well that hasn't been really addressed. Um, people are with remote working, people are just being, and like, you know, the kids, if you, let's say, make it uh, no phones, kind of, the kids are going to go back to their, they're going to have the communities and schools, whereas adults don't have that anymore. There seems to be just, they're not having access to their communities because everything is now online. So what about addressing, uh, and I'm just interested in, in studies and has, has the, have those problems been addressed? Regarding adults. Okay, so it was a little hard to hear you. The yeah. amplification system kind of muffles muffles the words, uh, but I think you were calling attention to the advertising business model that Facebook pioneered, um, in which the the children are not the customers; the customer is actually the advertiser. That's how they make their money. Uh, so, if that's the case, the issue with cigarettes was a little different because it was the tobacco companies themselves advertising their product to children. 
Uh, I have seen a few ads, like from Snapchat, trying to say they're not social media, but in general, these companies don't have to advertise to get kids on. It's the social forces that keep the kids on. Um, at least in the United States, there's no way, I don't think it'd be legal for Congress to outlaw a business model, to say you can't have an advertising driven. I mean, because most, most media is advertising driven. We can't stop that or ban that. Um, uh, but if, if your broader question was about financial incentives, yeah, I'm all for that. Um, it's very hard to figure out. Um, I mean, the main financial incentive I want is that we should hold them responsible for what they're doing, especially to children under 13. So I'm hopeful that there are, you know, there are thousands of lawsuits, parents suing because their kids are dead because of something that happened on social media. So I'm hopeful that this will end up with gigantic penalties. Um, I'd love to see a competing business model. I'd love to see some different platform that wasn't advertising driven. Um, and there have been some attempts. I don't know how being real work, but um, but yeah, I haven't seen any yet that was basic. On the adults part, if your question was, I, I couldn't actually hear most of it, but if it was just about what's happening to adults, I don't know. That what's happening to adults, um, their mental health isn't really going down in terms of depression, anxiety, but we all feel fragmented. We all feel kind of overwhelmed. We're all feeling it. And that's part of the reason the book has done so well is I don't have to convince anyone. Like, everyone feels it themselves, everyone sees it in other kids, so we kind of all knew something bad was happening. And my book just kind of said, here's exactly what it is. Thank you, and thank you very much for your talk. So, uh, I'm going to go to a bit of a different topic because I'm dying to hear and pick your brain uh, and hear what you have to uh, say about it. At the end of the, your book, you mentioned that initially you wanted to do a research about... I'm just going to ask you again, the amplification. So hold the mic closer, is it? Hold it, hold it a little closer. And I think because the recording, okay. you have to use the mic. Um, but speak a little more slowly and a little more loudly into the mic. Just it'll help everyone hear, I think, right? We have some trouble. Okay, please go ahead. So at the end of your book, you say that initially you wanted to do a research about the impact of social media and democracies. And I'm hoping to pick your brain on that. Uh, so we do see a decline in democracies, we see it in the KFAS report, we see it that as the boss convention saying misinformation is the top risk that the world will be facing in the next five years after years, it's only been climate change. And I'm wondering what are your thoughts about that? And if you, we, I can add another little question, you, you said your opinion about legislation and it would be interesting to hear your view on section 230 as well. Um, so, um, let's see. Um, wait, the, uh, the, wait, no, sorry, the first thing, wait, the, f the very first thing you said was, wait, now I lost it. Yeah. About democracy. About democracy, of course, about democracy. So I set up, the original title of the book was Life After Babel, Adapting to a World We May Never Again Share. And I, and I had, because I, I, I had all these ideas for what was, you know, since about 2014, my entire academic life has been, what the hell has happened to my country? We're going completely insane. We're, we're heading off of the list. And I can see that by 2015, 2016, even before Donald Trump. <laughs> um, and I had a strong sense that it had something to do with the change of the information environment and social media. So I've been studying it ever since. And that was really my focus, was democracy. And I had this side project on teen mental health because I'd written The Calling American Mind. That was a sort of a side project. Um, and, and so I, I, I uh, got a contract to write Life After Babel about what social media is doing to democracy. And I was going to start off just chapter one, it was going to be about teen mental health. Look what happened to young people when they moved onto social media. They, they became mentally ill right away. What happens to democracies? But once I got it all laid out in the first chapter, which is the first chapter of the book now, I realized this is a whole book that I have to get out as quickly as possible. We've got to address this problem this year, not in three years when I finished the big book. And we can address it. We can actually solve this problem, at least you know, really make it a lot better in just a couple of years. Whereas the next book, we'll be called Life After Babel, is going to be really depressing. Because the problem is much harder, and it's completely partisan. That is, any solution about content moderation, the, the, the left is going to be doing the content moderating, and the right doesn't trust the left. So, so anything about content moderation is going to be a partisan issue, we'll never get it through Congress. Um, uh, and I don't really know what to do. Like, I can suggest a few things. But I, I can't give you four reforms that will save democracy. Because the fundamental problem, was put this way by Tristan Harris of the Center for Media Technology, is that the technology, and especially AI, is helping authoritarian countries be better authoritarian countries. But they can do in China 
is so far beyond what Stalin or Hitler or anyone else could do. They can compete with social credit scores. I mean, they can have an amazing authoritarian country in China, thanks to the technology. And the technology is really well made to make democracies crumble in upon themselves with constant fighting and distrust of each other in institutions. So the technology is making democracies worse democracies. So this is a hell of a problem, and I don't know how to solve it. But I know for sure that if we raise a generation that is not able to have arguments and debates and work things out and be self-governing and, and, and work out conflicts and, and make rules for themselves, if we raise a generation that doesn't have those basic skills, then there's no point in even trying to do reforms to voting or media or anything else. So I'm focusing on this first.